Well, this is start time, so let's go ahead and get going. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this presentation on teaching tactics here in virtual worlds. We'll be looking at how emerging technology can help bring us together in new and hopefully satisfying ways. My name is Steve Van Hook, uh, or Kip Raffo, here uh, in World. I'm an educator and a researcher, and that's what we're going to consider today is research and results in virtual world education. Uh, I'm not selling anything. Uh, let's make sure that text is working. There it is. For those of you that are watching for the text, there is a welcome for you as well. I'm glad to see it's working. I'm going to be sharing a number of links as we go. Uh, and links to uh, research references and resources. Hopefully there's going to be some useful stuff here for you. Uh, you are welcome to grab a PDF of these slides. They have uh, active links in them. If you'd like to follow along, you just click that little I letter there on the bottom of the screen, uh, and that should get you a PDF file of these slides, and I'll be sharing uh, links again later as well, uh, once you've decided if you really want to go through that or not. Uh, here is an abstract uh, today of our topic, and a bit more about me. Uh, if you're watching a stream or recording, uh, you can also get uh, a PDF file of these slides at my research website. There it is at the bottom of this slide here, www.mr.us. I'll be showing that link again later. Uh, I'm here in sunny Southern California where it's still about an hour away from noon. Uh, if you could type in chat where you are uh, in the world, I I'd like to know that. Uh, this presentation uh, is a topic uh, that I shared with the Science Circle in Second Life uh, about a year ago on how COVID might impact uh, uh, the education and delivery uh, of it. And back then, there was a big question mark after just about every sentence. Uh, uh, we are likely to see uh, some changes uh, from what we've gone through over the last uh, two years, going on three years, as we uh, try to find a new normal. But it's, it's safe to guess that we are certainly not going to go back to the way things were before, at least not in the near future. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's take a look at how things might be uh, in the months ahead. Let's look at what uh, London-based uh, Global Health Foundation is saying. It says that uh, COVID is not going away around the world anytime soon, and we need to learn how to cope with it, thinking and planning and coming to grips with a new way of living. It's an interesting article. You can get the link right there on the slides if you get the PDF. And those of us here in the United States, we also need to keep in mind that more than 95% of the world is not us. I love to see just how spread out we are. Uh, thanks for sharing your locations. Uh, and we need to care about that wherever we are in the world. If nothing else, we're all impacted by uh, global supply chain disruption. Uh, I will be uh, sharing some data and resources as we go. Much of it uh, will come from this assortment of articles, well, from the Chronicle of Education, Inside Higher Education, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, BBC, uh, Harvard Political Review, and uh, other credible sources. Uh, I'll be uh, sharing links to additional resources in these slides. Uh, once again, uh, you can get these slides here in World simply by clicking that little I or going uh, to the website, my academic site. I'll give you that link at the end. I'll be focusing primarily on U.S. news uh, and issues since, well, that's where I am uh, here in California. Uh, but, you know, if it's happening here in academia, it's likely uh, happening elsewhere, or at least they're suffering the fallout from, uh, from our crises. Uh, here are two interesting articles from a recent edition of Inside Higher Education. Uh, COVID cuts in international travel uh, have impacted educational exchanges between young creative students all over the world. Oh, that's such a loss. 
uh, organizers uh, are trying out different online platforms to increase and improve uh, international collaboration for students. Uh, and also uh, virtual job recruiting programs are reaching out to uh, populations of historically marginalized college graduates. Uh, they're also looking at the technological alternatives to help us do it better. And of course, uh, we're all talking about the metaverse and trying uh, to figure out how people are gonna be staking a claim in it or not avoiding it altogether. Uh, here are 10 companies, according to Gizmodo, uh, that might actually survive all the hype and the recoil uh, of the last months. Uh, you can check this story. It's really got great backgrounds and, and some of the tactics of each of the companies, what they plan to do in the metaverse. Uh, and you can get that article by clicking uh, the Gizmodo link uh, in the slide. And, of course, way up there at the top is uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, uh, Big Plans. Uh, and uh, it's also it's great to see uh, that uh, these uh, immersive virtual worlds are so newsworthy, especially of late. I, I think that's a good thing. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, well, he calls it the holy grail of social experiences. And it's hard to argue with that. Uh, some of us have been there, done that two decades ago. Just check out the difference here between uh, the Facebook Meta uh, avatar and contrast it to a sophisticated avatar here in Second Life. We know we're looking good. I love that her that you got to be kidding look on her face and <laughs> the look of surprise on the. Uh, Meta avatar. I really wish I could watch more what's going in the chat. I know that's where the fun is, Astra getting a giggle uh, out of it. Uh, fortunately, I'm juggling three balls here. So if I miss something in the chat, uh, I will come back and review it uh, after the presentation is done. So please, please do keep uh, the comments, suggestions, questions, criticisms coming. I like it. Uh, what I do uh, uh, suggest that if virtual world learning as a platform is conflated with the metaverse debate, well, that might do us some harm. Uh, we're not saying people should perpetually live uh, in a digital world, but for the times we do, where would you rather spend an hour of lecture? Uh, Zoom uh, is also trying to offer uh, an immersive uh, experience. Uh, it's right there along with the speaker or gallery view options in Zoom if you haven't seen it yet. Um, it looks to me like uh, those cutout stand-up signs where you stick your face uh, through a hole. Uh, and uh, I don't I don't see why people are going to use this when they don't already share uh, their video uh, in regular Zoom meetings. I've led hundreds of these sessions, and I really, I just don't see it working. Uh, but, you know, Zoom really does, I think, deserve some credit for stepping in and stepping up uh, in uh, this COVID crisis. But certainly we can do better. I'll tell you one thing Zoom has been surprisingly useful for is is for a tool for me to demonstrate virtual worlds uh, to uh, hesitant visitors that don't want to download the platform, but they're very curious about getting a look at it. And Second Life actually looks pretty good uh, in Zoom. There's a screenshot right there from my uh, laptop. Uh, there is a slight lag as it feeds through, but for the most part, as I zoom around in Second Life, uh, so it zooms uh, in Zoom. Uh, I see some comments here. It'd be interesting to hear how some of your own experiences with Zoom are. Uh, I, I, I get the audio and the video come through fine, and even the dolphin clicks and the chirping birds uh, play through uh, Zoom. And I can give an individual tour or a group tour, how many ever people log into the session. And, and the good thing about this, most educators are familiar with Zoom these days, and there's no virtual world learning curve as they simply ride along through my avatar's eyes. Uh, and this also 
uh, addresses some of the top concerns uh, I hear from first time visitors. I'm going to be talking more about uh, how do we bring them in for the first time, hopefully back again for a second time uh, to a virtual world. Some of the comments that I get uh, that their hesitancy is, well, it's scary. That's probably the number one comment I get is they're afraid to come in. Uh, they're intimidated by it or it's just too complex. Uh, or they just don't want to sign up for a new account uh, just to come in and check it out. But Zoom, uh, I found, is working very well, and I plan on doing more of those. Uh, and there's there's so much to show. Case in point uh, is all the sci Science Circle presentations year after year for uh, 15 years now, I believe. It's, it's a true testament to really what virtual worlds can do uh, consistently with clear vision and good intent and impressive immersive experience. Uh, what we have uh, is this wonderful and real sense of place. There is context and proportion and exploration and tactile interactivity and even fun and games. And we don't get that in a Zoom class where every face is flat and in your face. And it's just, I find it exhausting. Uh, much of the time, uh, we're talking to a room of shadow silhouettes on top of that. Uh, I have uh, recently built a new virtual world educational region, taking advantage of uh, the Linden Laboratory nonprofit rates. Thank you for that, Linden Labs, if you're in the room. Uh, and this is specially uh, designed to serve first and likely only one-timers uh, in world for single session uh, seminars. And it's meant as an example of why to come in and teach in virtual worlds rather than the how-to of it. And I found simplicity uh, is key. It's set up so they can follow simple directions to get in world, land at our landing pad, walk a little bit, and then sit in an auditorium. And there's tutorials as well that they get how to walk, how to fly, how to uh, adjust your avatar, how to go shopping, stuff like that. Uh, and uh, uh, there's minimal clicks, no poses, no automatic uh, note cards, and it's meant to minimize this cognitive overload and system freeze. We all get it. I got it uh, just trying to find my seat here uh, today, and I've been in World 15 years now. Um, uh, and sometimes, you know, the most difficult educators uh, to get in world, I found, are the ones that have already been here uh, before and they found too many challenges or they had an unpleasant experience and they're not too eager to come back. So this, using the Zoom is a gentle way to reorient them, uh, reorient them to what this is all about, especially if it's been uh, five, ten years since uh, they've been away. And yes, I tell them, uh, there's nasty stuff going on in the virtual worlds, just like in the real world. But there's also wonderful free concerts and exhibits and conferences and lectures and experiential learning. And just like the real world, everyone gets to choose uh, where they want to hang out. Uh, I have long been a fan of the concept of immersive virtual world learning, and there's really nothing new here. My whole life, uh, I've watched it growing uh, as we have been uh, tapping uh, old technologies, trying to find new ways of teaching and engaging people. Now, there was the show Winky Dink. Uh, I'm really dating myself here, started way back in the 50s, and Bill Gates praised it as the very first interactive television program, and you had this magic screen on your TV set. You can see it there uh, on the slide, uh, and you could become engineers or tacticians or uh, part of the program by drawing bridges and ropes and cages to save the day. Uh, and it encouraged children to be innovative and creative problem solvers. And, and, and those of us who couldn't afford the 50 cents, well, uh, for the magic screen, we just drew right on the TV. Ah, it was a fun program. 
Uh, and then uh, there was the Gumby Show, also uh, an immersive, engaging experience. That was in the 60s, and it let us break through the flat dimensional world of physical books uh, into the living, rich worlds of claymated animation. And my favorite were uh, the space travels. That theme song still uh, echoes in my head all these years later. Uh, and then there was the inner space ride at Disneyland. Maybe you remember that. Uh, I think that was around well into the 60s. Uh, and it shrunk us down to subatomic size so we could ride through the molecules and atoms of a snowflake. And suddenly there was the red pulsating nucleus. Does anybody remember that? Oh, there's somebody who remembers the coupon rides. I think actually this was one of those A ticket rides or a free ride sponsored uh, by Monsanto. But uh, aren't we doing similar things right now with exhibits uh, in virtual worlds? I know we are rides through major organs and such. And then movies uh, picked up on this as well, shrinking us down to cellular size to traverse a human body. Uh, that was in the film Fantastic Voyage. It's still worth a watch. I think it's on Netflix. What a fun movie that is. And it's just, it's a natural inclination of children and students and even we jaded academes. We don't want to just observe something. We want to experience it. We want to meld with it. We don't want to just look it through windows. We want to become a part of it. And we want to share that experience uh, with others. And even at just seven or eight years old, I felt this was the way uh, education should be. Uh, and uh, such visualizations and imaginings can, uh, can be more than educational. Uh, they can also be uh, foundational and formational. Uh, it's a low stakes experience with modeling behavior. Uh, here's an interesting article on cosplay and uh, the power of pretend. And it tells how heroic stories and pretend experiences can create an emotional response of elevation. And uh, there's a link uh, on this slide if you want to dig into that deeper. And for example, they did a virtual uh, reality study and those who were given the power of flight like a superhero were significantly more likely to be helpful than those who simply got to fly around as a passenger in a helicopter. And they got to feel a little bit how a superhero feels in flight. And that's what Elevation uh, is about. A very interesting article here, uh, if you'd like to check on that. Uh, and here's another example. Uh, studies show that when people have an immersion into someone else's experience, it creates an empathic response, experiencing like uh, what it's like perhaps to switch gender or races or to experience life in a war zone with bombs exploding around you or, or uh, spending your days uh, in a wheelchair. Uh, and this could be used, uh, for example, uh, in human resources sensitivity training. And, uh, well, uh, virtual immersion, what else does it do? It provides a sense of place. And one of the most memorable aspects of an education is that sense of place, uh, as they show in this New York Times article here, that years after uh, a student's education, it's the imagery uh, that remains the taste uh, of the experience. Uh, uh, Second Life founder, Philip Rosedale, what he said recently, uh, one reason virtual worlds have proven so attractive to educators and students is our desire for company uh, in learning. We want to look at each other. We want to see facial expressions and gestures, and uh, even if we're alone at our desk. And it's not just our desire for that sense of other, uh, but also our desire for a sense of place. I know I'm preaching to the choir on that one. 
Uh, new technologies, I think, uh, are going to make the experience uh, even more immersive uh, and realistic, uh, tickling all our fancies, uh, literally. Uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg uh, has been thinking about the merging virtual worlds and education for a long time, even spent $2 billion for Oculus uh, with that, that immersive goal back in 2014 uh, and we got uh, we got an early oculus headset and played with it for a while uh, my quintessential millennial did too uh, we played some games uh, and some educational programs and, but you know it felt more like a division uh, between us rather than something we shared together so we put it down after about an hour uh, and haven't played with it since and, you know we feel the same way about 3d movies i bought the special glasses and the 3d player and the custom tv and the 3d dvds but you know we quickly tire of that we still love our movies. We just don't need to take it too far. And, you know, it's not just the movies. Uh, it's the movie theater. It's the coming together that we enjoy. And, you know, sometimes uh, tech can just get in the way of that. Uh, but certainly uh, new technology uh, may make virtual worlds more accessible on our uh, smartphones and pads. Right now, there are 6 billion mobile phones uh, globally, give or take a few. 5 billion of those are in developing uh, countries uh, where it is their sole uh, means of access to the Internet. Uh, but cell phones are becoming ever cheaper and network uh, bandwidth is doubling every 18 months uh, and expanding into rural areas uh, worldwide. Uh, Internet tablets, uh, Internet-enabled tablets, where they're, they're the, now the fastest ramping device uh, around the world. And uh, solar tablets as well are especially promising in areas where uh, electricity is iffy. Oh, and as we uh, consider technological access, we also have to uh, consider socially uh, appropriate access. Uh, how, how can we connect with a global student body in a ways that are inclusive and engaging? Well, that's, that's a bigger challenge, I think, than the uh, technological challenge. Uh, well, by necessity, uh, we typically use English as our common language. 25% of the world speaks it, at least conversationally, uh, as a second language. Uh, it's our common language right now in this seminar, uh, gathering people from around the world. But we also uh, need to consider beyond the language a cross-culturally resonant context to build better bridges between uh, people's uh, culturally inclusive case studies and discussion topics. And hopefully through that, by finding our common ground, well, we come to better appreciate and respect and enjoy uh, one another's differences. Uh, and you can find a link, I, uh, my uh, UNESCO uh, article on transcultural learning uh, is there. It's a link to that. It's available in the slides. You can get a full text copy uh, of that article on my, my site. Uh, well, over uh, some 20 years, I have been designing and developing online and on-ground undergrad and graduate courses for uh, UCSB, UCLA, California, Lutheran University, Ellis University, National University, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, more than half of the courses uh, I've taught uh, are online. Uh, right now, they're almost all online. Uh, so the place uh, has been limited to the learning platform we gather in, whether it's Blackboard or Canvas or Collaborate or Brightspace or uh, whatever, uh, these platforms, they provide a sense of gathering, but they don't provide that sense of place. And uh, it, it's given me a sense of what works and what administrators are looking for and what students like, uh, though these often uh, aren't necessarily the same thing. Uh, and uh, for 15 years, uh, I've been uh, experimenting with virtual, uh, virtual educational builds for a few years. The Science Circle let me huddle in a corner where I set up some uh, sample learning demonstrations. Thank you so much for that, uh, Science Circle. I miss you guys. 
Uh, I've uh, been pitching and uh, uh, prodding administrators to take a closer look at virtual world possibilities uh, for about a dozen years. Uh, I do agree with many of the critics right off the start, yeah, that learning in virtual worlds can be a poor substitute for the real life thing. Uh, I wish everyone around the world could join me in a classroom there at Kerikoff Hall on the UCLA campus, my favorite building. I took this picture myself. Uh, and uh, there's some of my Korean students standing in front of the building. It is a gorgeous building, uh, reeking of the finest academic trappings and uh, tradition, uh, but you know, the ideal learning environment, which we don't have, of course, would be a diverse and well-appointed campus serving all comers, fully equipped, equipped classrooms and uh, reasonable numbers of students in the class, and of course, justly compensated instructors. Uh, that, unfortunately, is not where we're at, and it's certainly not where we're headed. Any administrators and educators in the room, you know that's that's for sure. Uh, it's also been said the uh, ideal teaching environment is Socrates on one end of a log uh, and a student on the other end. But, you know, that's not going to happen either uh, unless uh, they're virtual logs and a virtual Socrates. We can't even build uh, enough simple classrooms, uh, at least in the developing world, for millions, if not billions, of aspiring learners. So uh, we, as uh, well, uh, intentioned. I just, I really want to dig into this chat. I know, I know you guys are having some fun. Uh, what we do is well-intentioned and practical educators. Well, we're going to turn to a uh, technology to fill the gaps uh, as we have done for decades before, all the way back to Winky Dink at the uh, birth of television itself. Isn't that interesting? Uh, the first, uh, one of the very first uh, shows on television was such an innovative educational program. Giving a plug back to Winky Dink again. Uh, well, let's take a quick look. What's been happening uh, in academia uh, over the many months since uh, the COVID uh, crisis began? It's actually, it's been more of a morphing uh, change than a revolution or redesign. The transformational forces uh, before COVID, they were already in play. Uh, lower state funding and a demographic dip in enrollments and administrators stressing over budget cuts and program reductions. And up to 30% uh, of a university's revenue comes from dorms and dining. That's been a big loss and one reason they're so eager to get students back on campus. Uh, and these are forces uh, that have been simmering and expanding for decades now. And uh, now the blinds on many of our social systems are uh, being lifted everywhere, uh, and we can see clear just what's behind uh, the curtain. Yes, adjunctification is actually a Googleable word. Go ahead and do that. Adjunct adjunctification of education. Uh, spread the word too, because I think it's a it's it's not a really good trend, uh, and it hasn't been going well. Uh, here's uh, some interesting uh, innovative steps uh, that uh, they've taken at a couple of universities where I teach. Uh, after COVID closed uh, the UCLA campus uh, early in the COVID crisis, uh, they, they put up a virtual campus in Minecraft. Uh, it was interesting to look at. You know, I don't think they've done much with it. Uh, it's interesting to note uh, it was paid for out of the Bruin uh, Gaming Fund. That seems worth noting. Uh, and uh, National University uh, has uh, worked on an artificial intelligence program uh, to help engage students in online classes. I think one of my uh, administrators from National University may be here today. If you're in the audience, give a holler, holler out. Uh, the goal of uh, this program, artificial intelligence program, is to better engage uh, all the online students and the course discussions and tasks and to provide students with suggestions on uh, how to do better. Uh, artificial intelligence ultimately is going to come for us all, isn't it? 
Uh, and, uh, well, perhaps one of the biggest uh, obstacles uh, to beneficial change uh, is our negativity uh, bias. And, oh, boy, we sure see that at play today, don't we? We pay hyper attention to the things that might harm us or uh, could be dangerously unproven. And, you know, that's a survival advantage. I understand it. Uh, we have a negative bias to bad threats over the possible good. And actually, we can even measure that. It's a ratio of five to one, uh, says psychologist in, a, in an article you can click on this side. It takes one It takes uh, one positive thought to counter a negative is not enough. Equal time is not enough. We need to bury a negative under a pile of positives. And uh, this isn't being optimistic or looking uh, at the world through rose-colored glasses. It's just understanding the dynamic of humans and and uh, and being real and dealing with it it's a wonder we do anything thunder uh, thunders yes uh, and, and, you know, I think also to serve uh, our students best, we need to know them uh, well. And in the 20 years uh, I've been teaching, uh, the largest group of students working their way uh, through the program have been millennials. Uh, they were just turning 19 when I started back at UCSB in 2000. And they're still in my graduate courses. And there's the Gen Zers that are, are their livelier, younger uh, sisters and brothers now in my undergrad classes. And as an aging hippie from the 70s, oh, there's my hippie picture right there uh, on the screen. I was a long red, long hair, redheaded hippie. Uh, I've felt a special uh, affinity uh, with the millennials. Uh, <laughs> Uh, go hippies. Uh, this newer, uh, any hippies in the room, let me tell you, take a good look at these millennials. I'm sure you have. Uh, the, these newer generations, they seem much more focused on social issues and justice with this get over it attitude uh, towards racism and sexism and intolerance and bullying. And I really admire that. Uh, their spirit of change uh, and possibilities. All you hippies, go out, uh, go out and mentor a millennial. Uh, here's a few uh, interesting bits uh, about them. Uh, thunder hanging up on moccasins in '78. <laughs> Tagline: Good to see you uh, in the room. Uh, some interesting things about the millennials. Uh, those in the ec upper economic tiers of millennials are about to inherit some $30 trillion uh, from the retiring and expiring boomers uh, over the next decade. Uh, what else are we going to see uh, in them? Uh, more and more of what's interesting, more and more of these millennial heirs about to receive this money are saying they don't want that uber wealth. And uh, news reports tell about how they plan to give much of that money away. Uh, including uh, the real estate and the art and the jewels. And uh, no doubt that's harsh news to their elders. And this also coincides with a greater bulk of younger age groups who are unable to find well-paying jobs with any kind of future. Uh, and that is so sad. The uh, depression and the high rates of drug abuse and self-harm that are coming from that. Uh, and not everyone uh, wants or needs to go to school as a possible alternative, but for those who do, uh, we can make learning more accessible and more inclusive and more engaging uh, and more relevant, even more fun. Uh, Beth saying how hard it is to see the children go through that. It breaks my heart when the students come up to me after class and ask for my advice. I just, I, I don't know what to tell them other than to be prepared for anything. Uh, and, and something else to consider if predictions hold true with leaps in healthcare, uh, oh, such as 3D printing of major organs and uh, robotic surgery, ever uh, better levels of nutrition. If, as we see all this take place, millennials and their near generational cohorts may well live hundreds of years. This current generation may even see upwards towards 700 year lifespan. So we really uh, need to teach them well.
Uh, here is uh, another uh, prediction. By the year 2050, uh, some futurologists uh, uh, and economists say uh, artificial intelligence and robots will be replace, uh, replacing workers at all levels, including us uh, instructors, uh, in, in uh, entrenching this new breed of people that uh, the Guardian called a useless class of those people that are not just unemployed but unemployable. Uh, there's simply not going to be work out there. What are we going to do with these people? And you know, someone said it. It's not that we're that that they're born with two strikes against them. That's so unfair. It's that they don't even get that third pitch. Uh, it it's something we really need to keep an eye on. What are we going to do? Uh, and that's the challenge for this new generation coming up, our generation as oldsters. Well, we brought a lot of technology into the world. Well, now here's the even bigger challenges. How are we going to distribute uh, all of that? Uh, one interesting point in this uh, article uh, is they said as a substitute uh, for employment, uh, they predict that virtual reality worlds may ultimately uh, provide people with far more excitement uh, and emotional engagement than the uh, real outside world. Uh, these virtual worlds, well, they also provide a sense of place and belonging, so important to student success and retention. We all know that. Uh, so much of the college experience is not sitting in a classroom. We can do that just about as well uh, online. But students are looking to mix and mingle and play and party and experiment and socialize and that's what they might remember most and ultimately benefit uh, from the most come the end of their uh, education. Uh, the, the more we can connect with them in a context, a place, uh, the longer they may stay connected uh, with us. Uh, you can always tell whenever I take a quick peek at the chance that's ch at the chat that's where I lose my place <laughs> in the line for a whole lays. Now I'm getting hungry for a nice burrito uh, here in Southern California. We got great burritos. Uh, and uh, here are uh, some takeaways uh, from a webinar. It was actually a fascinating webinar not too long ago. Philip Rosedale was there, uh, the CEO of High Fidelity at the time, uh, and he was founder of Linden Labs. I believe he's back at Linden Labs now. And also uh, in this, on this panel, was the evangelist, tech evangelist, Robert Scoble. And, and they were previewing uh, some... Uh, uh, some emerging technologies such as uh, Sansar at the time. And when asked about uh, educational uses of the new immersive technology, they gave an in-depth response. And you can uh, find a link to the video and the session notes on this slide. They weren't there to talk about education, but given the chance, uh, they really had quite a bit to say. And actually, here's some of it. Uh, they said uh, that students are already using uh, AR and VR glasses to learn repair of uh, multi-million dollar Caterpillar tractors and Boeing jet engines with virtual overlays. and. Uh, we can also take a meeting in Yosemite at a finger snap and study the principles of gravity uh, between planets by actually flying through the universe. And we can visualize complex equations in math and physics and chemistry uh, with CD, uh, 3D models. Isn't that all exciting? But they also point out oh, well, that the cost of this virtual world design uh, may not come cheap. Uh, they, they pointed out that the uh, budget for the video game Grand Theft Auto V was some $400 million just for a single game uh, and effective uh, virtual world learning experiences will also be costly. Uh, but the cost, and this is the good news, the cost for virtual world teaching and simply hanging out and giving talks on a stage like this. Well, these are simple and inexpensive ideas that are going to carry the day where the physicality of place and manipulating objects with your hands is just magical. Uh, so say Scoble and Rosedale. Uh, I also uh, caught an interview uh, on CNET. Uh, 
uh, in uh, early 2022, Philip Rosedale again uh, says that uh, virtual reality headsets for fully uh, 3D immersion are not quite ready uh, for prime time play. Uh, I agree. Uh, they can be alienating uh, and isolating from our real life uh, surroundings. Not everyone is going to want to do that. Uh, what did uh, Rosedale said? Uh, it's like a blindfold to the real world, he says here on the slide. But even without the encumbrance, the encumbrance of headsets, we still need to answer why this particular platform uh, serves the experience and good uh, of our guests. We've got to get to the why of it, says Rosedale. And I think uh, we educators may have some worthwhile suggestions on that. In fact, here are a few suggestions. Uh, to those designing uh, virtual worlds and technologies uh, for educators, especially as we get ready for showtime. Uh, first, it's time to polish up everything and get ready for closer scrutiny because they are looking closer than they ever have before. Uh, online learning is only going to grow uh, now that we've seen the need and the service potential. Uh, many students may not like learning online, but more and more are starting to actually demand it. Uh, also, the educational uh, platforms and programs and companies uh, need to better understand the particular demands of academia, uh, especially the old stodgy administrators who don't understand the tech, and they just want to go back uh, to the uh, old ways and the old days. Uh, there's also very limited funds available uh, in academia right now, but there is money out there. Uh, and uh, there's also the overhead demands, and this is one of the big ones, the overhead demands on students to learn a new platform, to learn new skills. And on top of that, there's the Title IX horrors over privacy and harassment uh, in virtual worlds and performance standards that uh, universities are very sensitive to. Uh, to accreditation. Uh, again, I've been pitching a virtual world learning uh, to administrators for some 15 years. This is typically uh, what they reply. Uh, they say there's too much development time and cost, too high of a learning curve for teachers and students to learn the uh, platform with too little uh, practical use. You've all heard this, I'm sure. Uh, what we need to bring in, we need the accessibility of Skype where a single step gets you to where you need to be. Uh, we need the creative and simple filters of TikTok for design. We need the functionality of Zoom where slides and video and audio and files are easily shared with a single uh, click. It's easier to demonstrate uh, a virtual world in Zoom than to bring them into the virtual world. Uh, so we need to make uh, some of these changes. Some of them are uh, already happening. Uh, we also need to counter uh, what may be a gaming bias uh, in some administrators, especially in higher education. Uh, virtual world learning, well, it may not be a game in the mind of uh, us users, but others don't are, uh, always see it the same way. And you know what? I say so what? Learning can be fun and gamified. Uh, I've been playing uh, on the language app Duolingo. I know some of you have uh, played with this. I studied two years of Russian in college. I lived in Russia for five years. Uh, and speaking the language, I've forgotten most of it. But uh, I've relearned lots about grammar and vocabulary uh, in just two weeks on this app. It's fun. It's engaging. Uh, it's certainly educational. And, uh, and and on the games, you know, I watch my goddaughter play video games. She plays Monster Hunter, League of Legends, Cyberpunk, and she sure seems to spend a lot of time running from place to place uh, and exploring. And she says that's what makes it fun. It's that sense of place and space and motion. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we've also seen uh, that some of the new technologies uh, aren't always doing uh, what they hoped, what we hoped they would. Uh, students uh, were given access to network computers to enhance learning, but a Duke University study found that test scores in reading and math were actually falling 
uh, and that students in the one laptop per child program were spending more times in games and chat and, and less on actual studies. And we also have to uh, work harder to bridge the digital divide, especially between uh, rich and poor countries, um, mostly split uh, between the northern and the southern hemispheres uh, and between poor and rich communities within individual countries. We also uh, need to make sure that this digital divide isn't further compounded by a, a content divide. We need appropriate course materials that connect and resonate across national, cultural, economic boundaries, and uh, that's an issue dear to me uh, and core uh, to my research. And yes, 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 it can all be very expensive, but someone's going to do it. Uh, and there are many government programs around the world supporting better access to education. Here are a few on this slide. Uh, and there's also supporting foundations uh, with familiar names, Gates, Jobs, Sailor. Uh, and schools may also uh, well be shifting money uh, and uh, from lowering classroom uh, and facility costs, uh, hopefully to new uh, and better online options as they're convinced to give them a try. And, uh, and we need to see uh, the big picture, not just the view uh, from our own uh, perch as uh, educators. Uh, we need to appreciate the practical realities of administrators, uh, some, something sometimes we teachers don't do. Uh, we need to understand the desires and needs of our younger students. Uh, they are certainly facing a very different world and future than we did. Uh, and we have to nurture creative abilities and aspirations of educators and not just treat them like machine cogs. That's for us adjunctified teachers here in the room. Uh, and we need to embrace the ultimate possibilities and immediate limitations of learning technologies. Uh, and everything else really uh, is, is just what we always do, uh, is teaching and learning and using all the techniques that we already know uh, to their fullest uh, as educators. Uh, and I think we've also done very well uh, at adapting uh, to this crisis as educators as and as administrators and students. It's, it's really been inspiring uh, to me to see just what we can do uh, when we must. I am coming up on the final minutes here. I am watching the clock as we approach the 1150 or the uh, uh, I have 10 minutes away from the top. Uh, so here we are uh, sitting in a very difficult spot of preparing for a future still uh, so much in the fog. Uh, here is some basic advice on what we must do. First from a troll who says when we can't see the future, what we should do is simply the next right thing. So let's try to keep our eyes uh, on the next right thing, not get overwhelmed uh, by the horizon of it. And uh, here's some advice, speaking of the horizon, from a 10-year uh, sea captain. Uh, something as I tell my passengers uh, before we depart. Uh, there on this slide there, you can see a crew of uh, German students uh, from my international program at UCSB. Uh, I tell them, keep one hand on the boat, keep one hand on yourself, and keep a weather eye on the horizon. Uh, we need to be aware of our immediate times and our circumstances for sure. But if we don't watch the horizon for the subtle shifts in what's coming, well, we could wind up really, really wet. And that's it. I thank you so much for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here uh, at the conference. <laughs> Already I'm getting a request for rides. I'd love to take everybody out. Uh, hopefully uh, we will be back in another year uh, to discuss how the world has gone from too many questions uh, to a place with plenty of answers. And, uh, and perhaps we can find even better ways to reach out 
and teach others. And feel free to drop me an email, visit some of the resources I have. Educare, Educare Research, it's a nonprofit organization. My uh, region here in Second Life is a nonprofit. We're not trying to sell anything or make any money off of you. Do feel free to pay a visit. Uh, and uh, if you click uh, the I again on this uh, screen here, you can get a copy of the slides that will include uh, uh, landmarks to uh, Educare Research. And that takes us up exactly to uh, 50 minutes of the hour. At this point, I'm going to turn you all back to the conference. Uh, please enjoy uh, your time here, and thank you again so much uh, 